Who are you in this vast multiverse? Mr. Strange? Back in 2008, the first ever Marvel Cinematic Universe film, Jon Favreau's Iron Man, was praised for being grounded and realistic. In 2022, the MCU is something much more cosmic, taking its cues from classic comic books and worlds that began on the page in the 1960s. While many artists were responsible for what Marvel Comics would become, two of them stand out above all others. Avengers co-creator Jack Kirby and Spider-Man and Doctor Strange co-creator Steve Ditko. Long gone are the days of Kirby staples like Galactus being depicted as boring clouds. For the most part, AMCU has walked in Kirby and Ditko's footsteps when it comes to comic accurate costumes, and it seems to still draw influence from them for new releases. But what about the worlds surrounding those characters? The scale of the Marvel Universe has moved far beyond military and spy films, but has it gone far enough? And how much farther could it go? As Marvel continues its march into the future, it's time to take a look back at some of its foundations and the grand, colorful, eye-popping designs that made its more cosmic stories work in the first place. After three Earthbound movies, the MCU took its first step into the larger cosmos with 2011's Thor. Visually, it was a grand introduction to a larger universe and a story about Marvel's version of the Norse gods, introduced by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby in 1962. The film's version of Asgard arrives fully formed, and while it isn't an exact replica of Kirby's art style, the movie translates plenty of concepts from the pages of Journey into Mystery, like the Rainbow Bridge, and even the way he spins his hammer. The realm itself, however, is introduced with some pretty imaginative and otherworldly designs that feel unique to the MCU. While the designs of other Avengers have been reinterpreted many times, there are some creations that feel so uniquely Jack Kirby that you can spot them a mile away. Kirby machines, as they're sometimes called, usually consist of a few large basic shapes, but they're also filled with smaller geometric designs, making them look both intricate and simple all at once. For instance, the Celestials, the original gods of Kirby's Marvel Universe, seem to resemble candy-colored toys and robots, the kind of thing a child might play with, but they're made all the more fascinating by his use of scale, which is one of the things the Eternals movie managed to accurately translate. Even if the Celestials were all fairly similar in appearance, at least compared to Kirby's roster of wildly different eye-popping deities. Without us, our universe will fall into darkness. But it wasn't just the designs that made these characters unique, it was the vast and winding mythology behind them. Kirby was also responsible for creating the New Gods and the Fourth World Saga at DC in the early 70s, but these were originally meant to be successors to the Norse Gods at Marvel after they all perished in Ragnarok. Once Kirby returned to Marvel in the mid-70s, he brought some of those ideas back with him, creating his own pantheon of Marvel Gods and Demigods unconnected to existing human religions. Well, mostly unconnected. If you look at the early designs of Kirby's Eternals comics from 1976, you'll notice a lot of interesting biomechanical concepts. Machines and organic beings intertwined, like a more child-friendly version of H.R. Giger and his work on Ridley Scott's Alien from around that same time. In fact, ideas like Alien Space Jockey also appear in Kirby's work, and while it might be easy to assume Kirby and Giger influenced each other, it's more likely that they were both pulling from the same cultural zeitgeist, the concept of the ancient astronaut, a conspiracy theory stating that alien beings had helped build various ancient civilizations in Africa and the Americas. Just a few years before Kirby and Giger designed their ancient astronauts, Eric Von Daniken's book, Chariots of the Gods, and its subsequent documentary had planted those ideas in the public consciousness, with specific references to an ancient Mayan sarcophagus lid, which Von Daniken believed featured a figure meant to represent an ancient astronaut, which appears to have been the basis for the various space jockeys. Looking at the surrounding designs on the tomb, it's easy to see where Kirby got some of his ideas for how to incorporate shapes that might seem otherworldly to most readers. The idea's origins may not have aged well, but they became a launching pad for what would eventually become Kirby's signature style. Environments and costumes with hints of the antiquated and familiar, painted in bright colors and mixed with the futuristic and technological, a mix of past and future all at once. 
Some Marvel films have paid homage to those designs, but they haven't always been front and center. 2017's Thor Ragnarok features some guards and other background characters wearing Kirby-like costumes, and there's even a mural that references Kirby's artwork, but that's about it. In fact, the mural is taken directly from Fantastic Four number 64, in which it's the design for an enormous machine. God of Similarly, the Eternals movie features Kirby's Mayan-inspired space jockey on the wall of an Aztec temple. And, cultural confusion aside, it feels pretty tame, since little in the actual movie lives up to the pages of Kirby's comics. It features a few costumes and other designs with some pronounced shapes and colors, but none are as distinct or imaginative as the Eternals of Kirby's comics, in which concepts like his space jockey and more otherworldly ideas existed in the physical space around the characters, rather than as 2D easter eggs on the walls. Fittingly, this disconnect between 2D and 3D also applies to the other major influence on Marvel's cosmic corners, albeit in different ways. The trippy, boundary-pushing designs of Steve Ditko, who was known for more than just the way he drew hands. Like Kirby, Ditko was influenced by the culture around him at the time, specifically the psychedelic counterculture of the 60s, on which he also had a sizable influence in turn. Recognize this guy? Lee and Ditko introduced Doctor Strange in Strange Tales number 110, and right from his first appearance, there was something intriguing about him. For instance, the design on his gloves, which at first seems like a series of dots that get smaller, but the more you look at them, the more they start to feel like they exist in three dimensions, like they're moving further into the fabric, away from the viewer, kind of like a Star Wars crawl. The movie would borrow plenty of visual elements and designs from Ditko, but the first Doctor Strange film also had the responsibility of opening up Strange's mind and the audience's mind to brand new possibilities. It does this pretty adequately in the form of a montage, which hints at all the various kinds of worlds that exist across the multiverse. It's fun, but it's also not the kind of approach the rest of the movie takes. Like the Kirby designs on the walls, this Ditko-like trippiness is contained to one corner of the film. It's window dressing, rather than the main attraction. In the comics, Ditko was responsible for dreamlike, abstract designs that defied traditional comic artwork. It's more Salvador Dali than Superman, and the most interesting thing about it is the way it doesn't always make physical sense within the confines of the page. When Ditko died in 2018, writer Glenn Weldon pointed out some of the connections between Ditko's strange drawings and some of his earlier work on Captain Adam, specifically beams of light and matter that seem to surround both characters, emerging either from Captain Adam or towards Doctor Strange from some other realm when he's in the dark dimension. Only this isn't really how light works. It isn't its own opaque fabric the way Ditko draws it, but as Weldon says, it works on a purely visual, purely comics level. That's likely because it blurs the line between two and three dimensions, which is kind of fundamental to comics as a 2D medium that we're used to interpreting with physical depth. Many of Ditko's designs felt this way, especially the cosmic being known as Eternity. The character doesn't make sense except on paper, where he appears to be a two-dimensional window into a three-dimensional universe, almost like the character is made out of a wormhole. The rest of Doctor Strange has a fair number of kaleidoscopic designs, but the action feels less influenced by Ditko and more by Christopher Nolan's Inception, a dreamlike heist film which folds buildings and gravity in similar ways. That's not a bad place to steal from, but ironically, there are a couple of scenes in Inception that are actually kind of Ditko-esque, since they blur the lines between 2D optical illusions and three-dimensional space, something that doesn't really carry over to the Doctor Strange movie. A lot happens in Doctor Strange, of course, and most of it in a flashy manner, but where Ditko's drawings challenged perception, even the most inventive images in the first Strange movie feel confined by the screen. Oh! <laughs> However, this isn't always the case in its sequel, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. It only happens a handful of times, but the film does in fact feature a few fantastic moments where the lines between 2D and 3D blur in a way that might have made Ditko proud. There's a moment of a character being drugged with a magic potion that manifests as the screen contorting and stretching like a two-dimensional fabric, almost like the Phantom Zone in the early Superman films. At one point, a character even travels through mirrors and reflections, which feels a lot like Ditko's early comic panels, in which Strange would travel through doorways and pathways that seem to blur the line between two and three dimensions. Multiverse of Madness isn't the most cosmic superhero film to begin with, which is surprising given the title, but 
In a best case scenario, it could represent Marvel warming up as it prepares to do things that are a little less visually conventional and constrained, and a little more out of the way, like Kirby and Ditko's artwork several decades ago. Things just got out of hand. The MCU has recreated plenty of ideas from the comics, but there are always plenty more places it could go. The Marvel machine doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon, so there's no reason for it to not take bigger risks and go bigger and sillier as it gets more cosmic.